Hello everybody, today I'm going to start off with a question. Now, the year is 1845, and we live here in the United States of... America. America. Mexico. In 1845, Arizona was part of the United States of Mexico. And in fact, it wasn't until the year 1848 that the land that we call Arizona actually became a part of the United States of America. I'm here to tell you all how the United States of Mexico lost almost half of their land to a greedy U.S. president named James K. Polk. Now, I'm going to talk about the causes, the outcome, and some of the effects that this war has had. This topic, why, you say? Because I feel like I can give you guys a, a better understanding of U.S.-Mexican relations. I also feel that, that I can help you have a better understanding of, of Arizona's history. Uh, th this place that, that we live in, that we call home. So, first off, let's look at some of the causes. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica states the Monroe Doctrine, Manifest Destiny, and the U.S. Annex of Texas as reasons. Now, you're all probably like, uh, what's Monroe Doctrine? What's Manifest Destiny? Uh, and then I blame that on our, our poorly structured history classes. They're boring and lag on forever, and everyone, you know, everyone kind of sits there... Uh, uh, so today I'm going to be brief and quick. I'm going to tell you what it is and move on. Uh, about 20 years before the Mexican-American War, U.S. President James Monroe told Congress and basically all of Europe that the Americas were off limits to them. They weren't allowed to meddle in any affairs in the U.S. and nowhere in the Americas. Only the United States of America was allowed to do that. Now, you can kind of see how, how this would create a mindset of superiority in the U.S. Uh, basically, our president came out and said, we are in charge of all of North, South, and Central America. Uh, so you take that mindset and you complement that with, with manifest destiny, which is basically this idea that the European settlers had that their way of life was better than everyone else's. Uh, you can see, actually, there's a painting here. Uh, by John Gast, and it's called American Progress. And you can see here, um, this woman's name is Columbia, and she represents the U.S. She's beautiful, she's wearing white, that shows purity, and she's moving towards this kind of darkness, which is the unknown, uh, the westward expansion. And you can see she's bringing settlers, telegraph wires, uh, and a train along with her. Now this painting encapsulates the ideas of Manifest Destiny. So if you couple this with Monroe Doctrine, you get this huge superiority complex that all the leaders in the U.S. have. Now, you take that and you couple it with Texas in 1836 seceding from Mexico. Um, they established an independent republic and then subsequently actually became part of the United States of America. Uh, this happened in 1845, so the year before the war started. Now... All of that, you can tell, creates pretty tense relations between the two countries. Now, these tensions were actually exacerbated by a border dispute that the U.S. had with Mexico. Now, you can see here this red area uh, demonstrates the area that is disputed. Um, the Mexicans believed that their land went all the way up to the gray area here, and the people of the U.S. believed that it continued all the way the opposite direction. Um, there's two rivers. One of you, which you may know very well, um, it's the Rio Grande, it's the current border of, of Texas, uh, and the Nueces River, which is, is a little further north than the Rio Grande. Now, prior to the annexation of Texas by the United States, the Nueces River was considered the border between the U.S. and Mexico. Now, when James K. Polk came into power, he said, screw that, I want the Rio Grande. So, what does he do? He went ahead and ordered his general... Zachary Taylor to move his army into this disputed territory. Now let's let's step back from this. Pretend we're Mexico. One of our our territories, Texas, leaves us, goes to a country that that we actually revere and admire. Then this country tells us that the border we had previously agreed upon no longer exists, and then they move an army into that area. I mean, they're asking for war, right? So, Mexico, and I believe rightly so, attacks. They, they attack uh, General Taylor. They kill 12 men, and then they attack a fort on the Rio Grande, and are successful there. 
Those are the only two successful campaigns that the Mexicans had against the Americans in the Mexican-American War. Now, <laughs> hearing this, uh, President Taylor goes to Congress and declares war. He gets them to, to uh, approve a war against Mexico. Now this war, very brief, very short, it was only two generals went in, unstopped, untouched, marched all the way to Mexico City. Now the, tr the war ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which actually ceded many lands that you guys now know, California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, the Gadsden Purchase was also something that the U.S. went ahead. We spent $10 million to collect um, the bottom portion of Arizona and New Mexico. Now in conclusion, we see that the U.S. went in, took advantage of a country who revered them. I mean, they called themselves the United States of Mexico after the United States of America. It's a, a poor, recently independent country and our president just marched in and took whatever land he wanted. It's for that reason that I would say we should go back and change this misnomer and call it the decimation of Mexico. Thank you.